think we're heading into very scary times in Australia. If Melbourne is what it's like around the country, I, I definitely think that's the case. There is really rapidly rising economic insecurity amongst people in Australia. There's scary levels of unemployment in a number of areas, um, uh, in certain regional areas, in certain parts of big cities, and it's not being reported. So hidden behind the whatever the percentage of unemployment is they say in the media, of whatever it is, 5% or 6%, in <coughs> places like Broadmeadows, it's about 26%. And there'd be parts of other major cities that would be along those lines. And that's before the closure of the Ford factory and, um, and the flow-on effects to the um, auto components industry and Woolworths um, plans to shift its warehouse from Broadmeadows to some undisclosed destination to be totally roboticised. And I suspect it's because it's... Um, the most unionised and best conditions of all of the warehouses, um, Woolies warehouses. So, you know, and if it's 26% official unemployment, that means it's much, much higher. The real figures and youth unemployment is much, much higher. And the other scary thing is the cost of housing in Australia. The co whether it's buying, buying a house or gradually buying a house, gradually buying the windows, then the door, then the um, roof. Um, or whether it's renting, it is absolutely unaffordable. I don't know how anyone who's on new start allowance is affording to live at all. Well, actually, a lot of people aren't affording to live. And then you have the whole scenario of young people coming out of uni, working in supermarkets, because there's no other job in the, what they've trained for at uni, and then the people who used to work in the supermarkets can't get work there because all the uni students are working there. Like, we are facing... Um, a major economic crisis in this country. And then we're having secure jobs being replaced by workers having to become self-employed after they've been retrenched and there's no other jobs, or um, training, uh, unpaid training and, and so forth, and work for the Dole schemes. This economic insecurity is absolutely creating the conditions for racism in Australia. The situation, um, and this is in a situation when the union movement in Australia is probably at its weakest for decades. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some unions who are having a real go, um, but overall it is much weaker than it used to be. The implication of this economic situation and a much weaker union movement is that a lot of working class people, around 70% or so, um, have no experience of collective struggle through the unions. Um, now, some people do through their families or they ex previously experienced um, good unions and now they're unemployed. There's um, a higher experience than just the number of unionised workers. But, that, but there are a lot of workers, even my age, who've never experienced being part of a union or being part of industrial action. It's through collective struggle that you can focus people's attention on the real enemy, whether it's Turnbull or Abbott or Shorten or BHP or, you know, the big bosses, um, rather than people fighting amongst themselves. In the absence of collective struggle over economic issues, people are very susceptible to racist scare campaigns. So some of the scare campaigns about refugees at the moment are refugees get new cars given to them by the government as soon as they step foot in Australia. <laughs> that, that is believed by some people. Um, refugees get more than old age pensioners. That's been doing the rounds on 3AW in Melbourne, and there's a lot of people who believe that, including some social workers who ought to know better, theoretically. Um, some people in a class I spoke at just recently of TAFE students um, said that, you know, refugees are in, um, get access to lower interest r loans that the rest of us aren't allowed to have access to. So these are some of the things. Now, OK. I mean, it sounds stupid, but when people are feeling quite desperate, if they don't feel there's any way of fighting against that situation, then, then people are more prepared to believe stupid ideas. And all of these sort of ideas, of ones which we used, have previously been used against um, 
Vietnamese boat people and before that against Aboriginal people. Um, so, you know, the same racist ideas are going around, but it's when people are desperate that people are more prepared to believe them, especially if they don't have, if there aren't strong unions and strong social organisations in existence. At the moment in Australia, there isn't much struggle around economic issues other than the on-the-job issues that unions are engaged in. Um, Probably one exception, uh, I mean, there have been some other exceptions, I'm not saying it's, it's totally bleak, but um, actually in the, la the union session earlier, um, some of the ETU activists mentioned the, um, their campaign about um, their anti-privatisation campaign. There have been some other exceptions, but generally at the moment the left in Australia is mostly involved around um, issues like climate change, refugee rights, Aboriginal rights, and, and sort of various important moral questions of the day, but not so much around economic issues. And I think certainly in terms of combating the, um, you know, combating racism and rebuilding of unions and working out how to unionise totally unorganised, totally casualised workers is definitely part of building the alternative, trying to rebuild traditions of solidarity where it doesn't matter what your colour or religion is, we've all got the same enemy, which is the boss. But it was interesting in Australia when we got the first horror budget from the Abbott government, the most successful response to that was not organised by the left or the unions, it was Facebook spontaneous organisation through March in March. And that's really what galvanised, in Melbourne it was about 50,000 people on the streets. Problem is that style of spontaneous organisation doesn't lead to any ongoing organisation. In one of the sessions earlier today or yesterday um, on the far right in Europe, um, Dick Nichols mentioned that once the far right starts to get institutional positions as it started in France in the late 80s, it's not enough just to have counter rallies. I mean, you need to have counter rallies, but you also need to provide a political and economic alternative. And in that case, he was talking about how some old working class areas in France, which were previously the home of the Communist Party, where now it was the right, far right national front starting to gain votes and gain support. And I think this is, along with the comment of Marta Harnikas about the fact that it is not just sufficient to build social movements, we absolutely need to do that, but we also have to build the political instrument for class struggle. So I think those sort of two things together should focus our minds at this time when, you know, racism could catch on in a big way in Australia and totally divert people from the real enemy. The left does need to engage in the electoral process. I think the price of abstention from elections is it leaves a space for the far right to have both a movement on the streets as well as uh, um, representation in parliament and to be able to use that representation in parliament to build a racist movement. In Victoria, we already have a couple of councils with Rise Up councillors. Now, Rise Up is, um, is the group that's connected to Reclaim Australia. It's the Catch the Fire Ministry, which is a far-right fundamentalist um, Christian um, group in, um, based in Victoria, where if um, any Muslim made the sort of comments that Danny Nullia, their pastor, makes, They'd, he'd, they'd be behind um, bars as quick as they could come. And they're on the Casey Council that recently knocked back a, a mosque and basically said that there would be no, mo no mosque built in the Casey, um, uh, Casey Council. Engaging in electoral politics is an opportunity to engage with the, with the parts of the 99% of the population that are not involved in the various social movements that we're um, involved in and, and mobilising. Because really the social movements are really the more politically conscious parts of our class. And we need to find a way of engaging with, with other people. And in a sense, probably in unions also, unions would be, you know, I mean, politically conscious left unions also have to engage with this as well. But I think, um, we do need to engage in electoral politics to actually have an opportunity to have some sort of communication and discussion and dialogue with um, very unorganised people. 
So how to engage in the electoral process, because this is also a very important question. I think we have to engage very differently to the mainstream bourgeois politicians. I mean, firstly, I think we've got to, or one of the things, not necessarily in this order, we have to bust the lid on the, on the secrecy of the parliamentary process or, or council processes. I mean, certainly in Moreland Council and many other councils, there are all sorts of um, briefings of councillors by council bureaucrats which are meant to be behind closed doors and all sorts of discussions in confidential business. In my belief, none of these should be confidential whatsoever. It should all be open to the public. Because <laughs> because it's behind closed doors where deals, they might not even be a handshake, they might not even go that far, but there's attempts to influence you and draw you into um, common sense politics, which is right-wing politics. Um, we also have to challenge the undemocratic nature of the bourgeois capitalist democracy parliamentary system. I mean, people are campaigning around an issue, like in Moreland Council, there's 11 councillors. People come to council meetings to raise their voice. Then the people who are affected by that decision don't get to have a vote. It's these 11 people who might not be affected by that decision who vote on their behalf. And that is really a very undemocratic system, in my belief. We actually need a di direct democracy system where people can vote on the, change, on the decisions that affect them. I think also the electoral tactic has to be, is not more important than the building of the social movements. We have to see the two things hand in hand. They have to be combined. How I got elected to the Moreland Council, I mean, yes, I got the donkey vote, but that wouldn't get me, wouldn't have got me elected. I was on the back of my involvement in the refugee campaign, relaunching the Refugee Action Collective, um, my involvement in union solidarity picket lines, um, the, environment, the climate movement, um, Palestine solidarity and Middle Eastern solidarity, uh, as well as um, relating to the anti-development sentiment in, in the suburb. We have to use anyone who's um, worth their salt as, as a leftist or conscious socialist elected to these positions, we have to use these positions to build resistance and try and develop community resistance, help, help communities resist and build ongoing organisations of resistance. Sam Wainwright, our comrade in Fremantle, who's also a councillor, says that being a councillor is like being a union delegate and a, a, a good union delegate does this, um, and that is a good approach to take, where you take up the big and small issues, but also help build resistance, help residents get organised so that they're speaking on their own behalf, not just you speaking on their behalf. We need to challenge, a critical thing is challenging the neoliberalism, which can be tricky. They try and tie you in knots. And there's a whole section of the left people who are very good people, but have been caught into supporting neoliberal solutions because of the clever ways in which they're sold by the ruling class as being choice. And they introduce, I mean, sometimes it's not the big sell-off, especially in the services. They're not necessarily just trying to sell them off the way they do with electricity and water and various other things. With the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the re um, registered training organisations or dodgy training colleges, as the real name is, or social housing, or, you know, they're basically, you, or even how they're trying to introduce choice about schooling to try and get people to send their kids to private schools. It's all about trying to undermine the public sector and justify contracting out, selling off, outsourcing, etc., under the guise of choice. And a lot of people, including a lot of progressive people, have fallen for um, have fallen for some of these neoliberal solutions. Not because they're bad people, but because there hasn't been sufficient discussion in in the broad progressive movement. I mean, a socialist in an elected position has to also expose the superficiality of some of the so-called solutions to climate change and family violence. Because a lot of you know, there's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of 
pretense about being caring about family violence without putting the money into the so, um, into the services. And I think it's critical that we have to challenge people's consciousness, uh, challenge people to go beyond their current consciousness, have to build an alternative current, build an understanding of how the capitalist system works. That's really, really important, not in a lecturing or a preachy way, but in trying to actually help um, people start to understand how the system works and who the enemy is. Um, I guess probably maybe just fi uh, finishing on this point, I think one thing which my, our experience and Socialist Alliance's experience with these positions is, is fairly limited and uh, we haven't had a long experience of this, but certainly for me it's reaffirmed my belief that people can change society for themselves. I mean, there are all sorts of issues I've taken up on council and not necessarily socialist lights positions, but they fit in with the perspective of people and planet before profit. And basically people go off and do the research and come up with solutions themselves. And so in a lot of ways, it's actually, um, it's really um, a very genuine, not a corny, but a genuine, partnership between me and members of the community who are campaigning for their rights. So I think, um, I don't know, that's a bit based on our experience of um, doing this work in, in Moreland in, in Melbourne, um, but we have to also, part of that is also <coughs> building coalitions as well. I'm just in there. <laughs>